First, I would like to say for both John and for me that this is such a treat to be here. We are finding it so exciting to watch as you put together a jury system um, that is uniquely Argentine um, and think through all the things that we take for granted in the United States as, as you do this. Um, so I have been to Argentina three times before today in various parts of the country and I have developed a great love for Argentina and for the Argentine people and of course for the Argentine jury. So. Oh. Uh, so, so Uh, it's okay, it's okay. So we were asked to speak today about three particular topics that are of interest to you here in La Plata. Uh, and we have, sp I have spoken uh, last year to some of the judges in the province of uh, Buenos Aires, but I have never been before to La Plata. So we went to the cathedral, the beautiful cathedral, and you ordered a beautiful blue day. So this is a very wonderful place to be. We are happy, happy to be here with you. We th uh, thought that we would speak for um, a short period of time about these topics because I see in this big room, well, medium-sized room with many, many people um, that, that there may be some questions that it would be best to answer specifically. So I will talk a bit about uh, jury selection and about jury instructions, very specific things, and then John will talk more about deliberations so that we cover um, uh, a little bit of this uh, terrain. In the United States, we have studied jury selection and we have some things that we have done well and some things that we have done not so well. And some of them are similar to things that are going on here and some of them are, are somewhat uh, different. So I'll try and distinguish those. We have, over time, from the beginning of the country to today, expanded the eligible jury population. So when we started out, only men who owned property were permitted to serve on juries. Today, everyone who is a citizen and at least 18 years of age is eligible to serve on a jury. So how do we find them? Well, we started with voter registration lists because voter registration is optional in the United States. Those were incomplete lists. And we now supplement those lists with driver's license um, and other kinds of lists. Our challenge is to make sure that there isn't duplication from those different lists of the people on the list. We also worry about when we send a jury summons to someone, will it get to their address? And that, I think, is a problem also here in Argentina as to whether somebody will receive the jury summons. We have a problem because some of the poorer people tend to move very often, and so some of the letters come back and they haven't reached them. So we are working on ways to improve that, and what we tell the people in the United States is that they have to update their lists every year Otherwise, they will be stale and they will not be able to reach the widest variety of people. So that is something at the beginning. We also have moved to one day, one trial, which is what you have here at this point. P 
people are summoned for a particular trial. And that also makes it easier to get jurors to come into the courtroom. But once they get in the courtroom, the procedures are varied across the country, and we work hard, not always successfully, to pick a jury that will be fair to the parties in the case. And one of the things that we do is the judge, and I think you have a similar situation here, is that there is questioning to see if a person is able to be fair in that particular case. And there are two ways that a juror can be eliminated. One is if the judge excuses the juror because the juror acknowledges that it would be too difficult for them to be fair in this particular case. And I want to tell you a little bit about what one very special judge smartly does when he instructs the jurors. Because it is hard to admit that you can't be fair. So it is up to the judge to create an atmosphere that says, it is OK to admit that in this case, you can't be fair. So I hope I'll get this right. What the judge says, not with these um, teams in mind, but he says that, um, for example, I am a very strong fan of estudiantes. <laughs> and I. And I could not be a good referee in a case, in, uh, in a match involving estudiantes versus gymnasia. <laughs> but if I were asked to judge a match between Boca and River, I could be fair. This sets the stage for the jurors to say, maybe in this case, maybe because it involves drugs or it involves someone accused of killing his wife, maybe I couldn't be fair because of my life experiences or beliefs. So this is a very important atmosphere to create in jury selection, and the judge is in a position to do this. Of course, it is the case that not all judges are able to detect bias in potential jurors. We all have biases. Our research shows that judges have biases as well as jurors um, and lay people having biases. So there is a, an example that comes from California in a jury selection I observed where the case was involving an armed robbery. And during the questioning, which is a very important part of the trial, one of the jurors said he worked in a bank. Fine. He worked in a bank that had been robbed the week before. So the judge said to the juror, was that a difficult experience for you? And the juror said, yes, it was. And the judge said, you know, I think this is not the right case for you to be a juror on. We won't ask you to serve in this particular case. And the judge excused the juror. Now, not all judges would do that. And so we have a kind of backup system, which you have too, which is we give each side a number of peremptory challenges. Four here, I think, on each side. That, I think, is a good number. We sometimes give too many, I think, in some states. Four is a reasonable safety valve to ensure the 
the um, uh, ob the neutrality of the jurors as much as possible. And we in the United States have only two limits on the use of those peremptory challenges. One is you cannot excuse somebody based on the race, their race or ethnicity, and you cannot excuse somebody based on their gender. And we say um, that those are off limits. Um, those, any other reason you can use in order to remove a juror who you think may have a hard time being fair to your side of the case. Our peremptory challenge system is not guaranteed in the Constitution, but it has been in place for all time, for all tradition, from the beginning of the jury system. And the idea behind it is the notion that defendants and the state will feel greater procedural justice if they have something to say about who serves on the jury. And those people who they think will be unfair to them can be removed. So the questioning period during jury selection is an important piece of the process. Second topic, okay. Second topic is uh, jury instructions. The jury instructions, um, uh, sort of a bookend, the, the selection of the jury, and then the instructions at the end, because before the jury goes to deliberate, they need to be instructed on the law they are to apply. What we are moving toward is giving jurors preliminary instructions at the beginning of the case so they know something about the law before they begin. Jurors in the law and the law are a controversial concern among some people who have looked at the jury system. When I started studying the jury system many years ago, I wondered whether lay people could actually be trusted to apply the law. Now, all of these many years later, I had an opportunity to study how jurors respond to the law during their jury deliberations. We were permitted to videotape jury deliberations. And what we find is that if the instructions are clear, the jurors can apply the specific law that's applicable in that particular case. I am a lawyer, and we sometimes say, well, it took me three years to study the law to be able to understand the law. And you might say, well, if it takes lawyers three years and studying and writing exams, how can a lay group understand the law and apply it properly? And I think the best way of understanding it is to say, that the jurors are not learning three years of law. They are being taught about the law that is relevant in this particular case. And if the instructions are clear, they can learn the law they need to apply. I serve on the uh, instructions committee of the uh, courts in my area. And we work very hard to create jury instructions that are clear. And one of the things that's funny about this process is sometimes we discover that we have to clarify what we lawyers understand is the meaning of the law in order to be clear and explaining it to the jury a very important um, uh, process. Most states in the United States now have these pattern jury instructions committees that come up with standard instructions. And I think 
maybe as you move forward, you will want to set up such committees. These committees vary across states. Um, some of them have only lawyers and judges on them, prosecutors, defense attorneys, and lawyers. And some of them also have former jurors on them, which is a very good addition to making it clear what the problems are in making the instructions clear and what kinds of communication will be, will be more uh, effective. Now, um, I have watched jury deliberations, as I said in this research, and watched how jurors deal with the law. And two things I think are most important about this. One is that the jurors work very hard to understand the law and to apply it to the facts in the case. And two, an important piece of deliberations and the jury system is that the jurors can help each other understand the instructions. So if somebody has a misunderstanding about what the instructions say, somebody else will take out the instructions and say, no, but it says here. And if the jurors have a disagreement about what the instructions say about the law, there is a safety valve for that as well. The jurors can write down a question and send it to the judge, and the judge will consult with the attorneys and write an answer to the jurors so they have a better understanding of the law. So the process has safety valves in it, and the preparation of how to do a jury trial is an important piece of making successful uh, jury trials take place. Mucho gusto. Uh, voy a hablar en inglés principalmente, uh, porque mi español es tan feo, pero estoy muy curioso que uh, si, hay, si hay translation uh, en uh, inglés cuando estoy hablando en español, pero no. <laughs> ok, bueno, uh, es mejor que hablo en inglés porque es más fácil a comprender <laughs> mi propio, uh, myself. Um, bueno, I study uh, something a, a little different from Sherry Diamond. Uh, Sherry is an expert on the jury. Todas cosas sobre el jurado. My expertise is in deliberation and democracy. I study the jury because it is an exceptional example of public deliberation. But it is for me part of a much larger topic. I will spend just 10 minutos discussing just this aspect of the jury, the quality of deliberation. So juries have been studied extensively to find out if the jurors really do engage in very thoughtful, careful discussion. Do they weigh the evidence? Do they understand the instructions from judges? And the answer is yes, they usually do. They almost always do a good job. Occasionally, they do an exceptional job. Sometimes judges will say that the jury discovered something that the judge w might have otherwise missed. Some juries, of course, do not deliberate as well. And I'll explain one or two reasons why sometimes that happens. But I want to stress first that there are, are two reasons First, that juries deliberate well, that have already been discussed. One is voir dire. The purpose of voir dire is to partly increase the chances that you have a good jury, a jury that is ready to deliberate on that case. Second, good instructions to the jury. The job of the jury is a difficult one. If the instructions are poorly written, if they are very hard to understand, or they are confusing and contradictory, it's a problem. 
So good voir dire, good instructions is a good start. But when the, when the trial ends and the jury goes to the deliberation room, the judge is still available to the jury, and that's important, but the jury is on its own. So one of the things that helps juries deliberate are the rules around its deliberation. And here I'm going to emphasize one rule in particular, that the most deliberative juries have a unanimous decision rule. Research has been done on whether juries that only have to reach a majority deliberate just as well as those that have to reach unanimity. And the jurors that have to be unanimous deliberate more carefully. A related point is the important question of what happens if you have un jurado estancado, a hung jury. Again, we have been discussing that this week, and it is very important that si tiene un jurado estancado, no es el fin. No es el fin. It is, in a sense, a mistrial. The prosecutor needs to have the opportunity to retry the case. And I will explain why both of these are so important. First, imagine yourself as a juror. You have just left the courtroom, and it is now time to deliberate with your fellow jurors. I guarantee you that you as a juror will know what is required for a decision. Sherry has conducted research on some juries where they were able to transcribe exactly what was said during the deliberations. And if in a civil trial, for example, in the United States, sometimes only a majority is needed, the jurors would say exactly that. Oh, we only need nine or 10 jurors to reach a verdict. In fact, yesterday she told of a case where a juror went back to the judge and said, we have enough jurors now, should we tell the other ones to leave? The minority, should they just go? Because we don't need them. This isn't mean, it isn't cruel, it's the reality of the decision rule. It is no different in a way from parliament. If in parliament you need a majority plus one vote and you have the majority, I guarantee you debate will end soon. So, that is obvious, that on a jury, if you have unanimity, even a small minority voice is important. Even if one juror continues to disagree, you must keep deliberating. You can't push them aside as you can when you have a majority rule. But there is a second thing that is just as important but no es obvio. What happens if the jury is hung? Well, if the jury is hung, some people have suggested that should be an acquittal. That should be the end. If the jury can't reach a conviction, um, it's the same as acquitting. Hay un problema. Si es, este es el caso, pense en este. You are a juror. Let's say it's a juror with a a 10-vote majority required. But if it's a hung jury, the trial is over and it's an acquittal. And you have two other jurors who want to acquit the defendant. There are three of you. The deliberation is over. You don't have to listen to the other nine jurors. Why? You don't need their votes. We don't think of it this way, but if that really is the end of the trial and it's an acquittal, and I want an acquittal, and I have three jurors out of 12, that's enough to stop 10 from conviction. That's all I need. Now, I don't mean to say that jurors, again, they are not bad people. We are not so selfish that you know, we, we wouldn't listen to our fellow jurors. I suspect we probably would listen for a little while. But we would know. We would know we don't need any of those nine votes to acquit. We have enough with three. Now imagine if it's unanimous, you require unanimity, but there's no retrial. If you're un jurado estancado, the trial ends and it's an acquittal. Now one vote is enough to acquit. I don't need to listen to anyone, not even them. Pero son muy amables. I want to listen to them. Bueno. But esto es, no es un chiste. Es, 
it's human nature. We want to know the rules, and we will follow the rules. And so for the purpose of high quality deliberation, one rule makes the most sense, unanimity. Because it both prevents a majority from just ignoring the minority, but less obviously, it prevents a minority from ignoring a much larger majority. It's a special decision rule, and I, I can't emphasize enough, in the United States, hung juries are quite rare. Um, when there is a jury trial, the odds are maybe one in 20 that you will have a hung jury. And if there is a hung jury, a question Sherry always gets asked is, what happens next? And I will speak broadly. She has exact numbers. But roughly, one third of the trials end there. The prosecution decides roughly. The prosecution decides not to go further. Um, in one third of the cases, there might be a settlement, uh, maybe a guilty plea, some change. And in maybe roughly a third of the cases, there is a new trial. Most of those cases that go back to trial result in a, in a successful prosecution. A smaller percent in an acquittal, and a very small percent in another hung jury. If you add the two numbers together, the chance of having two hung juries, my math said it's less than 1%. So I know it's something people worry about, but the experience with jury trials says it's rare. But again, I think there's a reason for having the unanimous verdict that should help you overcome those fears. It's that it really is, it turns out, one of the key features of a jury trial that ensures strong deliberation. And again, as a scholar of deliberation, I wish I could find good deliberation in more places in democracy. I wish my Congress in the United States was more famous for its high quality deliberation. It is not. But our juries are. And that's why I devoted 10 years of my life to studying just the jury to understand how it deliberates so well and to what effect. And I'll close with this last thought. One thing we can discuss more, if you like, is what happens to the jurors after they have this experience of deliberating. That actually was the real focus of my research. Many of the jurors are changed people. Because they deliberated, they become more politically active. They become more engaged. In our country, remember Sherry said, not everyone votes. It's voluntary. Some people don't even register to vote. After serving on a jury, you actually become more likely to vote for many years later. So that experience of deliberation is somewhat rare. And as a result for the jurors, it is a special experience that for some jurors actually changes them in really profound ways. We've already heard some cases of experiences like this in Argentina, and I look forward to discussing more the possibilities of jury trial aquí en Argentina. Muchas gracias. <laughs> Thirty minutes on the clock.